I suggest to anybody who's coming up through the ranks, like, if you think that you're struggling with something, try to teach it to somebody else, because then you will get a very solid feel for how much you know about that subject. Hello, everybody. It's episode 86 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Miss Jessica Henderson. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but I'm also your host here for Martial Arts Radio. I'm proud to say that Whistlekick makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the first time. If you're not familiar with our products, you should take a look at what we make. Our zip-up hooded sweatshirts are super comfortable, and they have our popular vintage-style logo on the back. Check them out at our website, whistlekick.com. If you want to see the show notes, those are on another website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, on either website, get on the newsletter list. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month, we'll never sell your information, and sometimes we mail out a pretty generous coupon. Today's episode is with Miss Jessica Henderson, a Taekwondo practitioner from my neck of the woods in Vermont. I've known Miss Henderson for most of her martial arts journey, but that doesn't mean I knew everything about her path. When we sat down last week, she was full of surprises as she hit me with story after story, connecting the dots in what is both a very unusual and somehow still typical martial arts beginning. So enjoy. Ms. Henderson, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. It's fun to have you. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So longtime listeners will know from the audio quality difference that this isn't a Skype interview or a no. phone interview, that <laughs> we are sitting across tables from each other. Yes, in my and house. In your house, right. And I'm trying to remember, I think I think the last time we did one of these was at this very same table. Yes. With somebody that you live with. Yes. So, uh, but this isn't about him. No. This is he, about you. He might come up in the interview. So he, we, might, we might talk about him a little <laughs> bit. Um, I will make reference in the show notes to which episode <laughs> that was. And, and I'm not saying it now because I think it might be fun for some of the listeners to try, I guess. So we'll, we'll just kind of let that hang out. Of course, anyone that knows you already knows who we're talking about. <laughs> but be that as it may, we'll just carry on. So <laughs> we'll start the way we always start. Obviously, if you're on the show, you're a martial artist. Yes. How did that happen? Peer pressure, actually. Really? Yes, peer pressure. Um, I was 16, and most 16-year-olds, any high school kid, really knows that peer pressure just kind of lives in high school. And I had always really liked martial arts, and I was always really fascinated by martial arts, but um, I was pressured into going. My two, I, got, I became close with two people, um, my friend Lisa and my friend Justice who went to high school with me and we had classes together and they would disappear on Tuesdays and Thursdays to go teach right. elusive martial arts programs that I didn't really know much about. And I, uh, they said, Hey, why don't you come down and like, check it out. And I, I did. And I went and watched Lisa's third Dawn testing. And that was really cool to watch and see. And I got to see all these black belts and everything like that. And it was my junior year of high school. I remember it's February, February, break right after February break. Mm -hmm. I went and I did a week. I did a trial week and, uh, you know, wearing PJ pants and a t-shirt and we did push-ups my first class, push-ups, the whole class. That's all we did. It was me, a white belt and a, a bunch of black belts in the teen class. That's it. That was my first experience with martial arts push-ups. I came back for more. That says something. I don't know what it says. I don't know what it says. It says, definitely <laughs> says something. But yeah, I came back for more and that's, that's how I got started in doing martial arts, 16, peer pressure. So a lot of people at, at that age might be interested in martial arts, but there's going to be a lot of peer pressure working the other way too. Yes. Because of course, when you're a teenager, going to a martial arts class is not the cool thing. Like no. it's, it's never going to happen. Uh, <laughs> I was doing martial arts. I was a black belt at that age and it was, and I still felt pressure against going to class, even though. At the time I was competing, I was training. So I know what that counter energy is. What was it about these friendships or about the class or you or 
whatever you had going on in your life that so overwhelmed that opposite influence that you not only decided to try it, but stayed with it at 16? Um, well, I mean, my friend Lisa is just, she's just got this magnetic personality, right? She yeah. just, she's boisterous and bubbly. And um, I think that was part of it too. Yeah. Her and I had had a longstanding friendship and, and, and I think she just sort of was like enticing me. Come, come try martial arts, come try martial arts. I always liked martial arts. I was never into organized sports ever. Yeah. My parents tried to sign me up for soccer and I'd be the kid that was like standing off in the corner of the field, like eating my fingernails or doing something like I was like, Oh, there's the ball. And like, I just didn't care. I didn't care for organized sports. Right. I never cared to, um, even like cheer on sports or go to sports events. Right. So, um, I didn't have any sort of activity level hmm. and, uh, I didn't like to work out on my own either. So the idea that I had friends going into the martial arts too, and they were cool friends. Like if you think about the social stereotypes that are in high school, sure. I, I was kind of the shyer one. I didn't really have too many friends. I had friends. I, I suppose lots of friends, but not really friends, not really great friends. Yeah. Lisa was a great friend and Lisa and justice were popular. They were the cool kids sure. at school. So, um, to do anything with them was, I guess in the social hierarchy of high school, pretty cool, right? pretty awesome to do that. So they, uh, they pushed me into it and I was never teased about doing martial arts ever. I was never, it was never thought to be like geeky or nerdy. Mm. So. Good. It, never, it, it just never, I never got that peer pressure coming from the other side. And it might have, have had something to do with the fact that I was an older teenager. Um, I know some of our younger teens, like in our school, get a little bit of that. Yeah. Oh, it's nerdy. It's geeky. It's weird. It's, they get that. But I think as an older teenager, I, I didn't quite get that. You were more past that. You think? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So you have that first week you know, in your pajama pants, <laughs> doing some push-ups, yep. you come back. So it was a trial week. So what was your mindset after that first week? I needed to do it. I needed to come back. It was Why? something I, I don't even know. I just, I just loved it. And I think it had to do with the fact that I've always really enjoyed this idea of martial arts, of being able to, um, to fight, to defend myself, to be strong and, and, and all that sort of stereotype that comes with mm. martial arts, I, the, the positive stereotypes, I suppose. Sure. Um, I always enjoyed that. And when I was, you know, writing stories or, um, anything like that as a, as a child, I was always trying to make a character that was a martial artist. So, um, I loved it and I went back and my stepfather, <laughs> he sat me down on the couch and he goes, I'm going to pay for a whole year up front. You cannot quit. You are committed to this for a whole year. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it for a whole year. I promise. You promise you're gonna do it for a whole year. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay for the whole year up front. I'm not doing any of this electronic stuff. I am paying for the whole year. You nice. cannot quit. I won't quit. I won't quit. And I did it. And I was, I was there for the whole year nice. and then more. Where do you think those early stereotypes about martial arts came from? Was it movies or stories from your friends or? Might have been movies. Might have been from the movies. Do you remember some early martial arts movies you might have seen? Uh, I wasn't allowed to watch any of like the scary movies or okay. fight movies or anything like that. Honestly, I'm going to be super nerdy for a minute. Go for it. Do and it. I think it had to do with my early love of anime and Japanese cartoons. Sure because there's a lot of that really rich culture and martial arts is in that culture with the right. samurai and, um, and that whole feudal era. And some of the anime cartoons that I watched had to do with that, or they were martial artists. The martial arts was involved. And I think that it might've had to do something with a little bit of that Asian, Asian invasion, cultural, right. <laughs> um, obsession that I kind of started out with pretty young. Okay. Pokemon, things like that. No, no, anime is not my thing. Um, <laughs> I've watched some of it. It doesn't click for me. 
but I know we've got plenty of listeners that are into it. So for their benefit, what were some of those early animes? You mentioned oh, Pokemon, gosh. but do you remember any of the others? Well, Pokemon was the was the game that I played, and I watched some of the show. Um, I'll make my best friend Sierra proud here for a minute. She, <laughs> she introduced me to this anime called Inuyasha, and it took place in the feudal era, and they all fought with swords, and they all had martial arts backgrounds. And they... I've actually heard of that one. Oh, my gosh. I, I've, I may have even seen some of it. I, I can't yes. say. <laughs> nope, she introduced me to that one, and, okay. you know... She was really super into anime and geeky things like that, and okay. uh, she still is. Don't let her lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> she still is. I mean, I still am too, but I think that sort of early exposure to that rich culture, right. Asian culture, helped build it, build it up. Sure. Okay. Cool. That... You know, it's a really different kind of origin story than we usually have. People usually start at teen years mm -hmm. or, or before, long before teen years, right? Uh, five, six, nine, or they're starting as adults. The vast majority of people we've had on the show started before 10 years old and maybe even before eight. So here, you know, we get a really different perspective from you. And so I'm just interested in that. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as we talk some more. So of course, this whole show is driven by stories. I know you've you've heard at least some of the episodes, yes. and you know we we get people to tell some pretty good stories, and I'm sure you've got a bunch of them. You know, whether or not it's going into details about what your arms were like after a whole class of push-ups, because <laughs> of course I know your instructor, and I, I when you say a whole class of push-ups, I can legitimately believe yes. that that this was not like oh we did a hundred push-ups spread throughout class. I can no. genuinely see that it you know, five, six, seven hundred push-ups throughout a class. But I'm sure you've got plenty of other stories too, so take a minute and tell us your best one. I got a couple. I got some short ones and I got some some long ones and I got some funny ones. All right, well do it up, um, start talking and, and if you get to a point where I need to cut you off, we'll I'll do it. All right. Well let's start um let's start at the beginning because that's the best place to start. It right? is. It's a good place. Um I'm trying to think the, the, the time. I think it was after I had started um, martial arts and I had attend I was attending a tournament. I was a, probably a white belt. Yeah, I was a white belt for my first tournament. Let me think about that. I was definitely, and it was, I was attending this tournament. My friend, Lisa, she was my, my guide, my mentor throughout my color belt years. And she was with me and we were in Johnson State College and they, uh, a long time ago, they had a, a second story where you could look down into the gym. Mm -hmm. And we were standing up there, and she's pointing out some uh, some guy to me. And she's like, do you see that guy down there? I was like, yeah, yeah. She's like, he is the grand champ of the grand champs. Nobody has ever lost to him in sparring. And he's just, he's the best. And, and she's just going on and on and on about this this guy. And uh, he's even at this point, he's only a, probably a couple of years older than I am. I mean, and he's just, we're watching him fight and we're watching him do the grand champ sparring matches. And he's so fast and he's so good at it. And I was just in awe. And she was, of course, not helping. The, she was not helping matters by going, he's the best. He kicks so much butt. All this stuff. Really, really hyping this, this man up in my head. Yeah. So, and I had no concept. I was white belt. I had no concept for what sparring was. I was just like, floored by how fast they were going and they were clashing coming back and points were being called and it was clash and come back and somehow it was all making sense to everybody and it was so cool to me right so flash forward a couple of a uh, couple of weeks later probably this man walked into my studio his instructor is um a student of my instructor so our schools are what you would call sister schools and uh, he was coming down to pay a little homage to to my instructor and he brought a couple of black belts with him and they were taking the teen class, which is the class that I took because Dunleavy had to have a separate class for teenagers so he could just grind our noses into the ground and beat us up, which was great. We loved it. So they're taking the teen class and we're all lined up. It was me, white belt, rest of them, black belts, because as we had just said, most kids start young, right. become black belts at teenagers. Not me. Really. Right. <laughs> Not me. Breaking the mold. So we were all lined up doing our warm ups. Grandma Stanley says to me, says to the, uh, the class, all right, front row, spin around, face the back row. There is this man facing me. 
Okay, grand champ of grand champs. And Grandma still me says, we're gonna do some sparring today. I mean, I just about lost my mind because he is standing in front of me and he's the best spar in our league. He's one grand champ for years and years and years and years. And I'm just like, that's it. My fleeting short martial arts career is over. I mean, he's just, this is it. This is the end of this. And I mean, all he did was just kind of looked at my belt, looked at me, looked at my belt, looked at me and went, hi, and smiled. And then that was it. Like I obviously he didn't get beat down on the ground. He didn't murder you. He did not murder me because I am here on the right. show. <laughs> right. So. Well. Yeah. Now on the other side of that exchange, I mean, cause clearly you went into that with one mindset. You yes. had an expectation of what was going to happen, and clearly that is not what happened. No. What did letting go of that preconceived notion do? I mean, did it did it open things up for you, or did you just say, "Oh, he must be a really nice guy," or you know, what was? How did that close up for you? I'm not I'm not really sure um, because I don't I don't remember the exchange. We used to play a lot of um, what I would call reindeer games, where you kind of shuffle across the line and you spar with anybody. Mm. So, um, I mean. Obviously, he didn't hurt me or this exchange was pretty normal because I don't remember it. Right. Um, I, as far as that individual goes, I just kind of opened up the doors for just complete fangirl awe because I was just so he was so cool and I was so not because he was a black belt and I was a white belt. And right. that's that's how that went. Um, but I never, ever had a problem sparring with the black belts. Because all my friends are black. That was all that was, as I said, it was me in the teen class as a white belt right. and all my friends were black belts. So I never had any like visions of grandeur or anything like that. It was just, we all, we all fought each other. We all played together. We all kicked the same paddles. We all worked on the same things. And, right. you know, they worked on advanced, you know, patterns or kata forms, whatever they worked on those. And I worked on mine and that was it. But we all were expected to do the same things. In hindsight, do you think that helped you progress? Uh, yes, I think it kind of shaped me to be like uh, a little hmm, more advanced. Mm, teaching martial arts kind of comes in like a need to know basis. Like if we give all the white belts all the information, they're just gonna like overwhelm and be like, I'm done, I'm out, like I can't do yeah. this, right? They just get overwhelmed, anybody would. Um, but as a white belt in with the black belts, it was, it kind of felt a little sink or swim. I had to go in and I had to do it. And of course, you know, what my turning kick, spinning hook kick might look like a little different than say my third degree friends, but right. it, I was still expected to do that combination. It was not differentiated down to my ability. So I, I had to rise to the level of expectation. Nice. And so I think it kind of just helped me stay ahead of myself and advanced. And I never had any visions of well, any different expectations of what a black belt was supposed to be than what a color belt was supposed to be. Cause we all have stuff to learn. We all have stuff to work on. Right. And that's all we did. We all worked on stuff. I think there's a lot of value in class structure that way. Um, when I was coming up through the ranks, it was not common to break out classes, at least at the schools that I participated in. And we would have, you know, one class, which was everybody. And then we'd have a second class, an advanced class, which was blue belts and up, mm -hmm. you know? So basically we we're just shutting off the white and the yellow belts in this karate school. But I always liked having the advanced ranks in front of me to, to look at, to say, you know, here, here's an example of what's going on. And one of the themes that's come up on the show, and it's kind of interesting to think of it in, in the context that you bring up is that a lot of people get to a certain level and then they stop doing, they stop doing what they can do in front of others. And it, it takes away that example that can be really inspiring to someone who is just starting out. Right. A lot of the class structure now is they separate and I mean, they have to sometimes at any given point, we probably have a hundred students in a day sure. training and you can't possibly put a hundred students in one room and train, especially with the space that we have. Right. But we separated out by age, um, when I was coming up through the ranks. So we had, you know, kids classes and then we had the teen class and then we had 
the adult class, adult classes. And adults could come and take the teen class, but it was never really separated by rank. It was always just separated by age. So we were always throwing in, um, you know, any, all the teens together. And I had, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the only white belt for, for long. We had some others come along. Um, my friend, Machina, who's been on the show, she has, she came up right after me. Right. Um, and you know, yellow belts and white belts in, in the sea of black belt teenagers. So it was always just by age when I was coming up. Now I'm curious because of course your day job is as a conventional yes. teacher, right? So I'm wondering, is there value in breaking out classes more so by age rather than by rank, do you think, in terms of um, just the psychology? I think they both have their benefits. I think um, the philosophy behind, <coughs> excuse me, the philosophy behind breaking up by a rank is that you can work on all the same things. Right. You work on all the same patterns, you can work on all the same kicks and the expectation is pretty level. Um, but as I just said, when I was in the teen class, the expectation for me and versus the black belts was exactly the same. So um, there's that. So uh, separating it by rank, everybody's on a level playing field. Separating it by age, I think you start getting it, it's a little different as far as interests go mm. um, and how you motivate is different than how, you know, how you motivate an eight year old versus a 16 year old versus a uh, 30 year old is very different. And as a teacher, that's what they do in school, right? You separate by, you separate by age, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Right. Um, and I remember teaching back in the, back in the day with uh, Grandmaster Delavy and we separated by age. We had the dragons and what we did with the dragons, the three and five year olds versus what we did with the children that were eight to 12, years old was different and right. versus what we did with the teenagers. We're all working on similar things, but the dragons, three and five years old, they only had a 25 minute class. We would have a little morning meeting, sort of a circle time beforehand, and they got to share what was on their mind and get school out of their head. And then they would run, they would just run all the time. They was never stopped moving and they would right. hit things and because they just got so much energy. Right. And then you can't do that with an adult. You can't just run them. You you could. You can, but you it's can. not going to resonate for them. Right. With teenagers, you can run them. Young adults, like in their 20s, you can run them. Older adults, are not. they're not coming to martial arts to be run around obstacle courses and right. yelled at and have circle time in the beginning. Like, right. that's not going to, that's not for them. Um, so there is benefit for doing it by rank, and there is benefit by doing it by age, and I've seen both. Um, and I like both. And I dislike both. Like it's, yeah. it doesn't really, I should, I shouldn't, it, it doesn't really matter to me, but I guess it's just at that point, whatever the school owner, it however is. it fits into their schedule. It sounds like it's a question of, do you prioritize the content, the curriculum that you're teaching versus prioritizing the style of how you teach right. that curriculum? So, and it's. It's tricky because, you know, you separate by age, you're going to get a wide variety of rank. Yeah. And if you separate by rank, you're going to get a wide variety of age. So right. it, it's just how you, how do you want to differentiate and how much challenge do you want? Right. I guess. And what kind of challenge? Yeah. And what kind of challenge? True. So that was a great tangent. Of course, yes. right? I mean, we, we know, I mean, that was <laughs> looking at the clock. I mean, that was a lengthy <laughs> tangent too. And I'm totally good with that. I mean, Listeners know, you know, I love tangents. That's where all the good stuff is. That's the meat. That's why the questions we ask are the same and rather simple. Let's pull it back. Okay. Now let's go back to high school. Let's pretend you're 16 and your friends don't pressure you into taking class, that they pressure you into learning pottery <laughs> or basket weaving or something that is not martial arts. What do you think your life would look like now? I can say with certainty that I most likely would not be a teacher today. Really? Really. Okay. Um, my love of teaching and how that came about was through martial arts because I was a yellow belt and Grandmaster Delavy threw me a red uniform and he looked at me and he said, you're on my leadership team. And I was like, okay. And what that meant was that I taught classes and that's all Grandmaster Delavy did was we, he had himself 
and he had a whole bunch of teenagers teaching Mm. and that's all, that's what we did. So I, when I was going in thinking about careers that I wanted to do as college, like majors that I wanted to pick out, my best friend Sierra looked at me and she goes, why don't you just teach? You teach martial arts. Like, do you, don't you love that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I love that. So I, I went and I started teaching all because I think between her, her pointing it out, her suggestion sure, and the background that I had in teaching and how I love to deal with the little kids and everything, I think was a catalyst for wanting to be a teacher now. And I think that when the, the days that I feel like teaching is so hard, like when I go to my day job and I'm like, oh, it's so hard, I have to kind of backtrack and remember why I started and do that. So, and it's always, you do this because you love teaching, you loved teaching martial arts and you loved working with the kids. So remember that, yeah. bring it back. Now, of course, this certainly isn't a judgment, but an observation. Most schools aren't gonna have someone at Yellow Belt a, a teenage yellow belt mm-hmm. teaching anything and of course you know at that age at that rank you're not teaching the black belts how to do no. things you're teaching i would assume younger yes and obviously lower rank students how to do certain things how do you feel that early emphasis on teaching affected your martial arts education You know you're an expert at something when you can teach it. Mm. And I very quickly became an expert at yellow belt. Like I became an expert at everything yellow belt lower. <laughs> That's what, like I suggest to anybody who's coming up through the ranks, like if you think that you're struggling with something, try to teach it to somebody else mm. because then you will get a very solid feel for how much you know about that subject. And I suggest to all my color belts as they're coming up and they're learning, you know, become an expert at the ra- of the rank that you're in. Become an expert of green belt. Become an expert of red belt. Become an expert of white belt. Um, and I mean, I wasn't really teaching. I wasn't doing much teaching. I was doing warming up and stuff yeah. for for Grandmaster John Levy because he came out and he still did all his own his own teaching. And I would warm up classes, but that helped with just my ability to handle myself and yeah. handle myself like a with with confidence and independence and command attention rather than rather than demand it and you know there were times where I was warming up the kid black belts and they had to you know they were yes ma'am and me even though I was a yellow belt green belt they had to because I was a leadership team member but I wasn't teaching them anything I was only warming them up and it just kind of disassociated age and authority Hmm. and made it so that you know just because I was older or they were more advanced in rank like we were all we were all just learning and I was an authority standing up there even though I was a lower rank which can go obviously the other way too right and of course I mean that kind of ties in with a a rather new somewhat recurring theme that we're having on the show about the difference in the skill to do and the skill to teach and that a lot of times most of the time in martial arts we lump them together we assume that when someone has achieved a certain rank that they can and, and they can do things with some proficiency that they can teach it and that's not only is that not true it's almost always not true it's, it's, foolish to it's think that rare way. but it's something that we don't tend to think about that it's just i think martial arts is probably the place where we make that mistake the most and I, i've been the more I think about it, the more I'm realizing that as martial artists, we need to be taught how to teach. Yes. You know, of course, and, and, and you get that. I mean, you're, you went to school for yes. the skill set to be able to educate, to, to present information to children and make them understand things. Yes. Right? So you get that. I mean, there's so much more of it involved than just saying, do this. Right. Absolutely. And we try to teach it young, too. We try to get some of our young advanced ranks we have some very young black belts we try to get them to go out there and and try out this whole teaching thing because it helps teaching doesn't teaching somebody doesn't hurt anybody like so what if you teach them the wrong thing there's going to be somebody we'll fix it later not a big deal like don't get hung up on it we'll fix it later no big deal what what is important there is that interaction between you know you 
are the teacher trying to convey something in such a way that somebody else can understand. You are not just l passively learning, or, or I guess actively learning, but you're not just sitting there l right. doing the art of learning. You are actually doing the art of teaching and the science of teaching and, and being able to, to do that. And I think teaching somebody else, I think it makes you better at what you do. I agree. Because you understand it. If you understand it enough to teach it, you understand it enough to do it. Right. Flat out. There it is. So I'd like you now to think about a time in your life where maybe things weren't rosy. They weren't great. You know, you were, you were dealing with something, whatever it was. And tell us how your martial arts experience or your martial arts training helped you move past that time. I quit martial arts for three and a half years. I quit. Done. Like just, you didn't just kind of fade away. Like you no, were. No, I faded. I faded out, but at, at a certain point, I just was kind of done. Okay. Um, and then the vicious cycle of which you don't feel like coming back. You try to come back, but then you realize that you're really out of shape. You don't know all your patterns, so you don't come back again. Right. I, I floated in that circle for a long time. I floated in that circle for three and a half years. That, coupled with graduating from college, trying to get a new job, moving around a lot, mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to find my place at you know 22 years old, trying to find my place in the world. Um, that was the low point. I had no stability, I had no consistency, no constant, nothing to get my energy out, nothing mm -hmm. to feel like, you know, no activity to make my body strong, to make me feel confident. Um, so my low point was when I didn't have any martial arts. And I had nothing. I was sort of floating in this abyss of nothingness, of jobs and no money and apartments and bad boyfriends and all this stuff, you know, just, just nothingness of my t early 20s. And it's with a slow fade that I left martial arts. It's with a slow fade that I came back. Hmm. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you and with the listeners on the show here, that period where I didn't have any martial arts is kind of blank. Like there's not much in there. There's just a whole bunch of nothing. It's just a smush in my head of days and weeks and jobs and apartments and events and it's nothing. It's just all jumbled in there. And martial arts helps keep that, keep the consistency a little bit. But it, I faded out. And then I faded back in and then it kind of came back to me and my uh, friends reaching out, hey, what are you doing? You know, we miss you, we haven't seen you in a while and going to a couple of testings and a couple of events. And um, it was in 2013, I want to say, that I, I came back. I went, to a, I went to a tournament and I visited people. I visited you, I visited um, all my martial arts friends and they just opened their arms and welcomed me back in and it was just this, it was a very powerful feeling. It was very emotional for me to just feel so like wanted in a time where I wasn't feeling and feeling like I belonged somewhere where I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere because I was shuffling from jobs and from houses and from places and things like that. And I finally came back when Grandmaster John Levy at the end of this tournament, he grabbed my shoulders and he goes, it's going to suck, but you just got to do it. We'll see you on Tuesday. And I came back and that was the end of it. I haven't looked back. So my low point was when I was missing martial arts. I was missing that Did you recognize that? I did not at the time because okay. martial arts at the time, I kept telling myself it was a luxury I couldn't afford. I was, um, I felt like I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. I was away from my home instructor. Mm -hmm. He was far away. He was an hour and a half. And I was in a visiting school and I was trying to pay tuition for both places, but when there's no money, right. martial arts gets expensive, new uniforms and gear and tournaments and events and, and things like that. And I just felt like it wasn't a luxury that I could afford. And at the time I just was like, Hey, whatever, whatever. I don't need, I don't need it. I don't need it. And having come back after that long hiatus, I had to call it a hiatus because let's, I had had no intentions of coming back. I had, I had quit. Um, but having come back, I recognized that as like, that's the, that I was missing martial arts. I was missing the community and I was missing 
the consistency and the routine that it offered me. Right. One of the things I've always said to people when, when they get into a spot, you know, kind of like, like you're in, it's, it's easy to say no, right? It's a lot easier to say no to things than to say yes. Saying yes to things is hard because there's, there's just so much to do. It's so much easier to not do anything. Right. Right. Martial arts is always there for you. And that's the thing I think a lot of people don't realize is that, yeah, there's the community aspect, there's the class aspect, there's, there's all of that. But what you've learned never leaves your head, right? It's always there. And so maybe you couldn't afford classes at the time or you told yourself you couldn't afford classes. But I'm gonna guess you needed that break because you could have gone in the backyard or in the living room or something and trained. I mean, there's always yes. something. I mean, there, there are people out there that struggle financially that find their ways to train. I, I, I know some of them, I've worked with some of them. But I think when something comes into your life and then it kind of leaves for a little bit, it helps you understand the value. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I, I quit on the cusp of black belt, which is why a lot of people quit. They don't want to test for black belt. It's sure. scary for them. Is that why? Is no, that's okay. not why I quit. I, I quit because I found that I was spending, I didn't have any time, I didn't have any money, uh, I was tired, blah, blah, blah. I was all sorts of things that, sure. whatever. But I think that if I had stayed with it, I don't think that I would be quite the same black belt today or then as I am today. Mm. I think that it would be a little different. I think I, I can respect and appreciate the rank a little bit more now that I'm a little bit older and I'm a little bit more wise, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you have to laugh through that. I, I, I have a little bit more life experience. I think that three and a half years kind of afforded me that opportunity to to have that perspective like all right well <laughs> life with martial arts here life without martial arts here life with martial arts again all right well <laughs> we've done this a couple times now let's this is better it's better to be here a lot of people seem to go through that time they may not actually step away from martial arts but sometimes it's just going through the motions and feeling uninspired and then something kind of kicks you into that you know, past that. Yep. You know, I was a little so, uninspired, for sure. So, well, yeah, I mean, you weren't there. I wasn't there. If you were I... really inspired, you would have been there. You would have found a way. Yes, of course. I would have found a way. So, Where there's a will, there's a way. And there, there was no will at that point. I was right. just uninspired. Think for a minute now. There, there have been a bunch of people that have had influence, a positive impact on your martial arts career, your you know, your original instructor, your friends that pressured you into starting classes. <laughs> um, the grand champ of grand champs that you thought was going to murder you. Who, incidentally, lives in my house. Who is in the next room right now. <laughs> um, who was on the other side of this table the last time that I was in this house. Um, but if we take all them out for a second, and I, I forced you to pick somebody who was the most influential in your martial arts upbringing, who would it be? Well, I do have to give a special shout out to my friend Lisa, who did push pressure me into martial arts, because not only did she pressure me into martial arts, she actually taught me everything that I needed to know between white belt and like blue belt. Okay. Everything. I, Grandmaster Dunby was my instructor, but every time I promoted to a new rank, Lisa was the one teaching me my pattern. Right. She taught me how to teach. The kids. She was my partner in crime when we taught when we taught the kids, and when we ever had to go to events, we were always driving together. We were always talking about her martial arts and her competitive days, and everything about her martial arts she passed on to me. Mm. And I carried the torch sometimes when she was when she was busy doing other sports and other commitments in school. I carried the torch of teaching for her. Like that's she taught me how to do it. Um, so I do have to give a special shout out to her yeah. because. Without her, I think my color belt days would be a little, a little different. And of course, she's been on the show. Yes, she too, has. Uh, episode seven, if memory serves me, we'll, we'll link in the show notes. But um, one of the top rated episodes. Fe Just putting that out there. Female master. I mean, whether or not there's a correlation, <laughs> I, who's to say? But the, those, the numbers don't lie. 
I think as far as influence, I'm trying to think of somebody outside of martial arts. Like, I mean, Master Jordan, who took me in, right, as a college kid sure. when I when I came, you know, I left Grandmaster John Levy's school because I was going to college and I, I went to Master Jordan's um, school. He took me in and he, he passed on everything and, and, and he and I have developed a, a fairly, I'd say a pretty close relationship as far as just, you know, Matt, beyond just like uh, uh, instructor and student, you know, I, if I need some different kind of advice, sometimes I'll just shoot him a message and, and yeah. he kind of in, guides me a little bit more. But I think I, my stepfather, he sat me down on the couch, I'm signing him up for a year, I'm paying for an advance. Yeah. And I think that he deserves some credit there because if he had not told me, girl, you were doing this for a whole year and you are not quitting, do not quit, do not make me waste my money, was a spur to, to keep me going. You know, teenage, teenage interests are flighty, you know. Sure. It, I could have had, had one bad day and been like, yes, I'm done, I'm out of here, man, I'm out of here, I can't do this anymore. But knowing in the back of my mind that I was going to disappoint him, if I just gave it up, yeah. I think kind of helped me continue and continue on that path. Why do you think he did that? Pay, for it, pay yeah. for it up front? Yeah. Well, my stepfather is a businessman. Okay. Through and through. He's a businessman. Um, so uh, economically speaking, it made sense for him to yeah. just pay for it up front because he didn't want to have to do any of... Uh, Grandmaster John Levy was doing a uh, uh, electronic... EFT kind of service at that point, and my stepfather wanted nothing to do with it. He wanted to be, he wanted to be, uh, he just wanted to pay for it, and he would have loved to right. probably have done like a check every month, but economically speaking for him in a business sense, it made sense for him to pay for it for the whole year, just write that, one that check. That couldn't have been the only reason. I, I think in his head, he knows things, man. He knows okay. things that about you? About me, that All like, right. I can't, I don't even know myself. You know, he's just, he's a dad, like he knows. And I think that he just kind of knew that if he didn't give me that push, that said, that said you need to stay with this, yeah. that, that I would have, in my flighty teenage girl kind of ways, that I might have just quit and left it. And I think that he knew that I needed that mm. to be pushed forward. So let's talk about competition. Oh, competition. competition. You've done some competition. I have done some competition. I haven't done any competition lately, but I've done some competition. Um, Tell us about that. Tell us about your competition. Time. I cried my way through my first tournament. Really? I did. That like, the one you mentioned as a white belt or you were yes, there? Yes, okay. that was that first one. Um, I, cried my way, I cried my way through that. Um, I was nervous. I was nervous to go out there. I was. I was in the adult division, right? So 16 and over, 16 right. and over, I was in the adult division. And to go out there and do my pattern just seemed so overwhelming. And I, and it was, and it was. And my stepfather had come, he had, he'd come to watch. And I remember looking in the stands and I didn't see him. He had like gone to the bathroom mm. or something. And I didn't see him. And I thought he was gonna miss it because my name, like my division was being like set up and they were calling out the other girls, like do their patterns. And I didn't see my stepfather. I didn't see him there, I didn't see him there. And I was just devastated that he was gonna miss it, that he had come to watch and he was gonna miss it. And I was nervous and all these end up emotions. I just sobbed my way through Chunji. Right. <laughs> but I made it through. I don't know what I placed. I can't tell you what I placed, but but I made it through, and uh, I continued to compete all the way through my color belt days, always. Did you like it? Um, I think so. I think I liked it. I, uh, I was always, I never really won anything. <laughs> okay, before that. <laughs> yeah, so, well, before that, I was never good at any, I was never good at sports or anything like that. I had no trophies or anything from my childhood. I was that, like I said, I was that kid that stood on the corner of the soccer field going, oh, look, there's the ball. <laughs> like, I didn't even care for any of those participation things or anything like that. But even when I was competing, I, I was always second place or third place. I never really won anything until red belt. And that's, I won grants twice as a red belt. And, uh, that was that was really good. That was really good to to feel like that to to win that um, as a red belt. 
it seemed very strange to me as all my friends are black belts and they always won grands and things like that. So to win it as a red belt seemed very like, wow, this is really cool. Mm. Um, and actually, to be frank, that was the last time I competed. Really? Was, How long I, I, went out was a, I went on a high note. Um, 2008 or 2009. and uh, It's a little while ago. It was a little while ago. Now as a black belt, I have some nerves about ever competing again as far as like what the black belt division looks like and you know the ladies division is getting bigger and bigger and they're, they're uh there's some really great ladies out there and i'll be honest like that idea of not winning of of standing in front of the judges and having them look at my pattern and go nah <laughs> It's right, like I, I get like nerves of that. I'm like, no, as if I'm going out there, I want to win. Right. And I try really hard and I, I, I work on my pattern a lot and I get feedback from my, my other black belt friends. And they tell me that, you know, my pattern's really good and everything like that, but I have a hard time getting out of my own way to get in front of the five judges and go, here's my pattern. So maybe I'll compete in the future. I gotta get out of my own head first over it. It's a good goal. Yes. It's a good something good to work for. There might there might be some listening that are thinking, and maybe I'm one of them that think because it's something you're really intimidated to do, maybe that's that's where the growth is. Maybe. I've i I've said that too, that uh, that to compete would be a little bit outside my box. Yeah. So it would probably be really good for me yeah. to get back out there and get into it and do it all over again because I used to be it. As a color pilot, I was a heavy competitor. I competed at all the events and I went, I traveled for some tournaments as far as Connecticut and New Hampshire for, for tournaments. And, uh, you know, I did okay. I did, I did all right. Sometimes I was the only one in my division. I won gold because I was the only one in my division, <laughs> which I, I, you know, as a teenage colored belt, like that's, Sometimes, like with the Epon circuit, when I would mm -hmm. go down and travel there, you know, I think they did it with like 16, you were 16 to 18, or usually 15 to 17. To, I, was, I was right in that, yeah. and there was just me sometimes. Yeah. So that was hard too, but maybe I'll compete again. I think you should. We'll see. We'll maybe see. I'll be there. We'll see. I'd like to be next time. So if you could train with somebody that you haven't, anybody, anybody at all, living or dead, who would you want to train with? Oh, hands down, Ronda Rousey. Really? Okay. Yes. Not because I, she's an MMA fighter. She, she's amazing. She's amazing at what she does. She actually has a judo background. Yep. And I have seen her flip dudes right over her hip. Yeah. And like break them. <laughs> and you know, not maybe not really break them, but hurt them. And they're like, whoa, you know. And uh, I'll probably talk about it a little later. But self defense is kind of partially why I started martial arts, that idea of being able to fight and defend myself, but it's a professional goal of my own to do, to work on my self-defense. And I think that she would be the lady to go to if I needed to work on some holds and some grabs and some grappling. She's awesome at it. What is it about Rhonda that really calls you? Because of course there are other people, they might be less well-known, but there are, you know, there's some, some prominent female grapplers. I mean, Kyra Gracie is, is very well regarded in the jiu-jitsu world. Is there, is it, I'm guessing it's more than just her, her skill in judo. Oh, the fact that she's a woman is helpful, I think. Okay. I, I mean, I, I don't follow um, UFC very, very much. I kind of just look at like the big names and things like that, but she's a, she's a female fighter and she did very good. Mm -hmm. She's very well, actually. She did very well in the sure. UFC. Um, and I just, I think that as a female fighter, she's around the same height, weight as I am. And I think that just watching her do all that stuff as a female fighter, as somebody who's about my size, um, I feel like I can, I, I can almost like relate to that a little mm. bit. Like, I, that would be so cool to learn. To, yeah. Let's work out with Ronda Rousey. Like, that'd be really cool. I think that'd be awesome. Okay. Great answer. And, and I think the first time we've, we've had her as that answer. So that's fun. I, I enjoy the different, different answers that people give to that question. 
favorite martial arts movies? Do you have a favorite? Um, couple favorites? Yes and no. Zero favorites? Sort of. Like, I watch the martial arts movies, but it's more because there are people in my house who force me to watch martial arts movies. Um, did, did perhaps two previous guests on this show <laughs> so overwhelm you with martial arts films yes. that you feel a little um, resistance to watching them sort ever of, again? Yeah. yeah. Sort of. Um, I'm going to be really faux pas here. I fell asleep during Best of the Best. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to watch it, but I don't want to watch it. Yeah. I fell asleep during it. Martial arts movies are, some of them are absolutely hilarious. Like, some of them are really B-rated, and they're funny. They're funny to watch. Because, like what? Um, I don't, they got crazy names I don't even remember. Okay. Like, the ones you watch on the El Rey network, yeah. the ones that come on, like, Kung Fu Tuesdays or something. The ones where the name has nothing to do with anything that yes. goes on. There's no plot, and it's just a sequence of fight scenes. Yeah, with, like... Like, uh, like the woman in the dragon kimono in the closet. I don't know. <laughs> something, something like this. There's probably a martial arts <laughs> movie called that out there somewhere. Because there are so many of them. Probably. And I enjoy watching them because I love to look at them and go, that won't work. Dude, dude, you can't do that. You can't do that. That's not going to work. And it's, uh, it's funny to watch them. But yeah. I can't say I really have, like, a favorite. That's fair. Thing. That's fair. We put out actually the, the most popular, at least of the time of recording this, social media post that we've ever done was, you know you're a martial artist if, and it was 10 things. And one of them was, you've ever been shushed in a movie theater for saying <laughs> that wouldn't work while watching a martial arts movie. Yes, yes. Right, and that if, um, I mean that post will pop up periodically on, on our different social media for, for people that are listening, but um, it got like, hundreds of reshares and shares of reshares. It just it was insane. It was just it's, it's the first thing we've ever done that truly went viral, so that was a lot of fun. But when you said that it reminded me of that. How about actors? Is there anybody you like? Despite hating their movies? It's not that I hate their movies. <laughs> That's not it. It's not that I hate their movies. Um it's just that you know, I was not the kid that grew up with martial arts movies and going, I wanna do that. That was not me. Like, I watched anime. Like, that's where I, my martial arts came from, was watching, like, Inuyasha and Rama One Half and, and, and things like that, you know? I, I, so to say I have a favorite actor, I mean, I could be really cliche and say, like, Jackie Chan or Jet Li or people like that, but... But not that's really. Not, that's disingenuous, and I don't yeah. want to do that. So. That's fair. That's fair. Books? Um... How about we get to something here? I mean, this is the last of the three content questions. <laughs> I do want to read, and it's been recommended a few times on the show, I do want to read The Killing Art. You have to. Um, yes, I've been told that I have to, and the copy that was in my house has moved out of my house. <laughs> so... <laughs> I bought that copy. <laughs> you did buy that copy. I, I, I bought that, that copy. copy. <laughs> that copy was given to somebody who moved out of my house. Um, into his own house. Right. So that's, like, great and fine, and I haven't... He's a book lover, and I totally did not get a chance to read that before he left my house. So I'll have to buy a copy and read that. But a lot of things that I read about martial arts come from the internet. Yeah. Um, so it's all true. Yes, all of it. <laughs> Wikipedia is so true. Make sure you cite it on all your research papers. Um, <laughs> for serious, for serious though, if I ever want to look at something that's outside of my martial arts, if I want to look at um, karate ranks, or if I want to look at um, kung fu ranks, or I want to look at something. Um, you know, judo, jiu-jitsu, anything like that. I First I consult Wikipedia to get a baseline. Yeah. I always like to get a baseline. Yeah. And then I start Googling. And I just, that's that's where a lot of my martial arts reading would, would come from, is from that. Like, not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, I did, uh, like, spent two hours on the internet looking up the history of Taekwondo. And ITF Taekwondo, and WTF Taekwondo, and ATF, and ATA Taekwondo. And try to figure out where I came from. Like, where, like... Yeah. Figuring out the Quans and the families and the Chundo Quan and you know where did the blue wave come from and yeah. why I was trying to figure it all out. I can't say I came to anything conclusive, but I did spend about two hours doing martial arts reading. <laughs> so the internet is usually where I get that. But I do want to read A Killing Heart. Okay, well it's it's a great book and it will completely for for anyone out there that has read it. Um, if you've trained in Taekwondo, at least for me, it kind of upended my perspective on what 
Taekwondo was. You know, I, I won't give anything away. I heard that that some of the political background of it is a little bit like, whoa, I did not expect it's that. It's so much more than whoa. It's insane. Yeah. It I'm, is literally... There, if, if the guy who wrote this didn't have the most insane collection of footnotes citing interviews and letters and all these things that he spent years collecting, I would think it was complete farce. Like you just made it up, complete fiction. It, it, it sounds like a ridiculous martial arts movie. It really does. That's, Someone I, could do a, do a, a documentary version <laughs> of that book, and if they didn't know that's what it was, they would watch it and say, this is ridiculous, this could never happen. Like the documentary on the mermaids or something. Right. Like a, a, a faux documentary? What are they? I don't know what they call those. A docu-fakery? Mockumentary? A mockumentary, yes. <laughs> I, I, I teach English. <laughs> I don't think we want to string the words faux and documentary together in that way. I think the, the junction point sounds like a couple other words <laughs> that aren't really appropriate for this show. So we'll move on. Okay. And anyone that gets that, kudos to you. If you don't, that's fine. Okay. How about goals? Goals. Everybody, yeah. you got to have goals in martial yeah. arts. Yeah. So we what keep are going. Um, first, promote. Uh, that's hopefully on the horizon. Um, why? Why yeah. is that hopefully on the horizon? No. Why do you want to promote? Um, to be to be totally honest, I want to learn new patterns, man. I yeah. I love learning patterns. Like that is, um, along with self defense, that is I love learning something new. And it's not something that I get to do very often as an adult. I don't get to learn sure. new things. Like, I, yeah, sure, going on the internet and reading stuff, uh, that's one thing. But to actually have somebody teach you something and you have to physically learn it. I love that. I love learning new patterns. So that's partially why I want to promote. And uh, just learn, just to learn more, just to keep going, you know? Um, another goal, another goal that I really do has, I, I want to start someday a women's self-defense program. I really do. It's something that I, that I find that I'm pretty, pretty passionate about, pretty okay. like, um, the whole disjunction, juxtaposition between male and female and mm. cultural norm and things like that. I'm very, I won't, I won't get on like a feminist soapbox here on the show. I'll try to avoid that. But it, that, that juxtaposition, I want, uh, it drives me to want to do a women's self-defense program and, and get every woman to feel strong and capable and confident and mm. I, that's because martial arts and self-defense helps me feel that way even though sometimes self-defense makes me feel like a little squeamish like the idea of like you know palm healing someone's nose into their brain makes me feel like that's so gross or breaking somebody's bones under my hands like that's yeah. that, it freaks me out but sure. it, it, the idea the actual real idea of it is, is alarming but but it makes me feel very capable, and I want every I want every woman from age uh, 12, 13. I mean, kids too, but kids don't quite, they're not quite as insecure as teenage, young teenagers. I want every woman from 12 to 13 all the way up to feel that mm. capable and strong. So eventually I think I'd like to get there nice. to teach something like that. It's a good goal. Yeah. You should do I that. I think so. I, I've had some feedback from some of my lady friends who they'd say, yeah, I would do that. If you, if you, if you taught a program, I would do that. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I'd like to. Nice. Yeah. Well, keep us apprised. Of course, if it happens, you know, we'll go back, we'll edit your show notes like we do for all the rest of our guests as they have new cool stuff coming up. We put it on there because, you know, we want people to know what's going on. We want to share these things. All right. So now is sort of your, your commercial time. Oh. You know, do you have something going on you want to share or promote or, I mean, I know you do, but <laughs> um, pretend that I didn't say Pretend that. that you didn't, but you didn't know that. Well, yeah. um, for, for the listener's sake, I have recently decided to branch out and start a blog and yeah, everybody starts a blog. I know that. Everybody starts a blog. Just humor me here for a hot second. Uh, Writing is something I've done for year, decades at this point, it feels like. I started writing when I was um, 
very, very young. And I never shared with anybody because I never wanted to burden anybody with, with my writing. And um, now the idea of starting a blog and sharing is very, um, it's very, it's, ooh, it's a little bit like, mm. it's a little uncomfortable, but it's new and it's there. And it, it's called tkdstudio.wordpress.com. Mm -hmm. And it's about martial arts. It's about traveling with a cup of tea, always. And um, you know, some creative, some creative writing out there too. And I do some, I've been freelance writing for one of our martial arts associations, um, PUMA, Professional Unified Martial Arts Association. I'm not sure, I think that's the acronym, Professional Unified Martial Arts Association. It's we'll, just, we'll make sure it's in the show notes. Yep, and uh, I've been doing some freelance articles for them. And that's, that's pretty new, that's baby, just like my blog. And cool. If everybody can go and check everything out, that'd be great. <laughs> we'll have links, but of course, you know, tkdstudio.wordpress.com. Yeah, so T, but it's it's uh, spelled out T E A. Like drinking tea. Like drinking tea, right? Oh. But oh, it's so a you're, you're, you're twisting it up. I know. Making it weird. Making it weird. <laughs> tkdstudio.wordpress.com. What kind of stuff will people find over there? Martial arts stuff. I've got a couple articles. Um, I have some really great interviews, actually, um, that I started doing for... Wait, you can interview people in words? You can yes. write it out? It doesn't have to be audio? Yes, yes. Oh, it's bizarre. No, it's just another way to do it. Um, some female martial artists that are in our association. I only have a couple. Um, and it, the project is called um, Portrait of a Femme Fatale. And it's just lady martial artists just how they feel about being a lady martial artist, how they feel about being a woman in general, um, and you know how they stay inspired and what yeah. inspires them. And you nice. know, the questions are a little different for each woman, um, depending on who they are and what I know about them. And they've been willing to share some really great stuff. Cool. So that project, I hope it will continue. But for now, I just have a couple of ladies on there. Cool. Well, of course, I've, I've played dumb as I'm asking you these questions, but I, I have read some of that stuff and it's great stuff. And I hope that the listeners do check it out. Thank you. Because um, we're never gonna be digging deep into the written word with this show, uh, at least not until we bring on more people doing the work. Yes, Because right. <laughs> uh, the irony is that I, I've spent a lot of time writing and editing professionally, um, but I enjoy this format. This, this, is, this is what I dig. This is definitely, this is so, different. This is my jam. This is fine. That, that, let that be your jam. It is. Oh, hot damn. Um, <laughs> anyway. Cool. So, you got any parting advice for the people that are listening? I mentioned something earlier in the show about getting out of your own way yeah. and not, ru not rushing. Um, I think it might. I think I might have mentioned it when I was talking about my hiatus, and not yeah. rushing into, um, you know, the life experience. Kind of let it, let it fill you. Let it, you know, I would be a very different black belt today than I would be then, mm. vice or whatever. And I, you know, just give yourself the time and the space to grow and get out of your own way and try to get out of your head a little bit when it comes to to doing martial arts. You're, you're not going to be perfect at it. Nobody's perfect at it. You have lots to room to grow. And when I was in the teen class, as a white belt to a black belt, the black belts, I saw that a lot. They still had room to grow. I certainly had lots of room to grow. So just take your time and, and remember that we are trying, as the instructors are trying to, to fill you up and turn you into a black belt. and turn you in from a black belt to a master and from a master to a grandmaster and all the way up. So, you know, kind of come to class with an empty, come to your classes with an empty glass so that it can be filled with stuff and just don't rush it. Don't try to pour it all and spill it everywhere. You just take your time and get out of your own way. And don't expect to be perfect. Nobody is. Thank you for listening to episode 86 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Miss Henderson. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes, including links, photos, and references to the other episodes we mentioned on today's show. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps that are available for both iOS and Android. 
For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember we randomly check out the different podcast review sites like Stitcher and iTunes. And if we find your review there and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. If you haven't left us a review yet, please do help us out and leave one. Those reviews are a lot more important than you may think. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always Whistlekick. Every episode is also on YouTube, so check us out there if you prefer. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon. Our zip-up hoodies are a whistlekick.com exclusive, so head on over there to check those out. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you should check out our wholesale program at wholesale.whistlekick.com. It includes discounted pricing and some other great benefits. But that's it for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Oh, one more thing. Don't miss out on the great training opportunity we have planned for July here in Vermont. The Whistlekick Martial Arts Weekend features a growing list of instructors who will be offering seminars that cover a wide variety of martial arts disciplines and subjects. One of them is Guru Chris Thompson, who will be presenting on Filipino martial arts, including usage of sticks, knives, and even bare hand techniques he likes to call dirty boxing. With multiple seminar choices during each of the many training blocks, the hardest part will be deciding which ones to take. A single low price covers your entire weekend of training, all your meals, great event shirt, and a private room. Can't make the whole weekend? We do have day passes available. So make sure you're there on July 8th, 9th, and 10th for all of the learning and the fun. Head on over to martialartsweekend.com for more information and to sign up. But don't wait. Space is limited.